Following Charles Darwin's book On the Origin of Species, anthropologist Hermann Schaffhausen argued the bones of the Neanderthal represented an ancient form of modern human. Professor Schaffhausen, who was a social Darwinist, also believed that humans linearly progressed from savage to civilized, and so concluded that Neanderthals were barbarous cave dwellers. More recently, an Anglo-Spanish team of scientists, which studied 43,000-year-old Neanderthal remains at El Cidron in Spain, has revealed significant physical differences between those from Northern Europe, and from Southern Europe and the Middle East. The analysis revealed significant North, South variations, with Southern European Neanderthals showing broader faces with increased lower facial heights. They analyzed the mandibles of the Neanderthal remains using 3D geometric morphometric software and imaging facilities. This revealed an astonishing North-South morphological gradient, and gives us an idea of typically Southern European Neanderthal facial shape. The research findings are published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The researchers found that Neanderthals fell into at least two basic ethnic groups that coincided with their north-south geographical distribution, southern Neanderthals from the Iberian Peninsula, the Balkans, the Middle East and Italy had broader and shorter faces than northern Neanderthals from populations living north of the Pyrenees, the Alps and central and eastern Europe. Whereas Southwest Asian Neanderthals were Neanderthals who lived in what is today Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, and Iran, the southernmost expanse of the known Neanderthal range. Although their arrival in Asia is not well dated, early Neanderthals occupied the region apparently until about 100,000 years ago. At this time, Homo sapiens seemed to have replaced them in one of the first anatomically modern expansions out of Africa. In their turn, starting around 80,000 years ago, Neanderthals seem to have returned and replaced Homo sapiens in Southwest Asia. They inhabited the region until about 55,000 years ago. In Southwest Asia, Neanderthals have left well-preserved skeletal remains in present-day Israel, Syria, and Iraq. Remains in Turkey, Lebanon, and Iran are fragmentary. No Neanderthal skeletal remains have ever been found to the south of Jerusalem, and although there are middle Paleolithic Levalloy points in Jordan and in the Arabian Peninsula, it is unclear whether these were made by Neanderthals or by anatomically modern humans. In addition, Neanderthals living further to the east, such as those found in present-day Uzbekistan and Russia are known as Central and North Asian Neanderthals. For example, a mude one is a nearly complete, but poorly preserved, adult male southwest Eurasian Neanderthal skeleton, thought to be about 55,000 years old. With an estimated height of 1.75 meters, about 5 feet 11 inches, it is considerably taller than any other known Neanderthal, and its skull has by far the largest cranial capacity, 1,736 to 1,740 cubic centimeters, of any Neanderthal skull ever found. This makes it one of the most famous specimens of Neanderthal skulls. Like other Neanderthal specimens in the Levant, a mude one skull is long broad and intermediate in cranial vault height, as compared with European Neanderthals and modern humans. With a large nose and a big face, a small brow ridge and small teeth, a mude one exhibits an unusual mosaic of features, compared to European Neanderthals. Contrary to the majority of other Near Eastern, and especially European Neanderthals, its brow ridges are slender and its chin, though still minimal by modern human standards, is somewhat developed. Although a mude one is considerably taller than any other known Neanderthal, its body is stocky, robust, and has short limbs, similarly to the cold adapted bodies of classic West European Neanderthals. Anthropologists initially interpreted these features as intermediate between Levantine Neanderthals and Levantine anatomically modern humans. Indeed, a mude one is highly progressive for a Neanderthal, and has many derived traits shared with early anatomically modern humans and even modern humans. But the immune one facial skeleton was incomplete and fragmentary, so its assumed form has been reconstructed, and measurements of the specimen, particularly with regards to the mid-face, are speculatory. Furthermore, a virtual reconstruction indicated that the immune one facial skeleton was smaller than previously estimated, and that the cranial vault was shorter during the individual's lifetime, having been deformed in situ by geological pressure.
Like modern humans, Neanderthals probably descended from a very small population with an effective population, the number of individuals who can bear or father children, of approximately 3,000 to 12,000 approximately. Proto-Neanderthals and early Neanderthals, living before the Eemian interglacial, 130,000 years ago, are poorly known and come mostly from Western European sites. From 130,000 years ago onwards, the quality of the fossil record increased dramatically with classic Neanderthals, who are recorded from Western, Central, Eastern, and Mediterranean Europe, as well as Southwest, Central, and Northern Asia up to the Altai Mountains in Southern Siberia. On the other hand, Proto-Neanderthals and early Neanderthals seem to have continuously occupied only France, Spain, and Italy, although some appear to have moved out of this core area to form temporary settlements eastward, although without leaving Europe. Nonetheless, southwestern France has the highest density of sites for pre early, and classic Neanderthals. However, Neanderthals maintained this very low population proliferating weakly harmful genes due to the reduced effectiveness of natural selection. Various studies, using mitochondrial DNA analysis, yield varying effective populations, such as about 1,000 to 5,000, 5,000 to 9,000 remaining constant, or 3,000 to 25,000 steadily increasing until 52,000 years ago before declining until extinction. The lack of sunlight most likely led to the proliferation of lighter skin in Neanderthals, although it has been recently claimed that light skin in modern Europeans was not particularly prolific until perhaps the Bronze Age. Neanderthals occupied a wide geographical range, so it's likely that they were variable in pigmentation, says John Hawkes of the University of Wisconsin, who is also studying the physical traits of ancient humans. Genetically, BNC2 was present in Neanderthals, which is associated with light skin color. However, a second variation of a BNC2 was also present, which in modern populations is associated with darker skin color. DNA analysis of three Neanderthal females from southeastern Europe indicates that they had brown eyes, dark skin color, and brown hair, with one having red hair. In modern humans, skin and hair color is regulated by the melanocyte stimulating hormone, which increases the proportion of eumelanin, black pigment, to pheomelanin, a red pigment which is encoded by the MC1R gene. There are five known variants in modern humans of the gene which cause loss of function and are associated with light skin and hair color, and another unknown variant in Neanderthals, the R307G variant, which could be associated with pale skin and red hair. The R307G variant was identified in a Neanderthal from Italy, and possibly Spain. However, as in modern humans, Red was probably not a very common hair color because the variant is not present in many other sequenced Neanderthals. In museums around the world, reproductions of Neanderthals sport striking blue or green eyes, pale skin, and gingery hair. Now new DNA analysis suggests that two of the most closely studied Neanderthals, a pair of females from Croatia, were actually brown-eyed girls, with brunette tresses and tawny skin to match. One complication is that traits such as hair color are controlled by multiple genes. To determine the cumulative impact of multiple genes on one trait, the authors assumed they could simply add together the impact of individual genes. One female Neanderthal from Croatia for example, had seven genes for brown eyes, one for not brown eyes, three for blue eyes, and four for not blue eyes. By the researcher's reckoning, that means a six-gene balance in favor of brown and a negative balance for blue, so her eyes were probably brown. According to this method, all three Neanderthals had a dark complexion and brown eyes, and although one was red-haired, two sported brown locks. Nonetheless, some genes may have helped modern human Europeans adapt to the environment. The VAL92 met variant of the MC1R gene, which may be weakly associated with red hair, may descend from Neanderthals although this is contested as the variant was rare in Neanderthals, and light skin in modern humans did not become prevalent until the Holocene. In one case, the wound that ultimately killed one Mesopotamian Neanderthal, in what is today northern Iraq, 50,000 years ago was most likely caused by the kind of spear modern humans used, but Neanderthals did not. 
What we've got is a rib injury, with any number of scenarios that could explain it. This Neanderthal was armed and dangerous, but analysis indicates the wound was from a thrown spear, and it appears that modern humans had throwing weapons technology and Neanderthals didn't. Researchers think the best explanation for this injury is a projectile weapon or dart, and given who had those, and who didn't, implies an act of interspecies aggression. Investigators used a specially calibrated crossbow, copies of ancient stone points and numerous animal carcasses to make their deductions. While narrowing the range of possible causes for the Mesopotamian Neanderthal's wound, and raising the possibility of an encounter between humans and a now-extinct close cousin, the research does not definitively conclude who did it, or why. The victim was one of nine Neanderthals discovered between 1953 and 1960 in a cave in northeastern Iraq's Zagros Mountains. Now called Shanidar III, he was a 40 to 50 year old, five and a half feet tall, male with signs of arthritis and a sharp, deep slice in his left ninth rib. A wound to the left ninth rib suggests that the individual died of complications from a stab wound by a sharp implement. Bone growth around the wound indicates that Shanidar III lived for at least several weeks after the injury with the object still embedded. The angle of the wound rules out self-infliction, but is consistent with an accidental or purposeful stabbing by another individual. Recent research has suggested that the injury may have been caused by a long-range projectile. The presence of early modern humans, possibly armed with projectile weapons, in Western Asia around the same time has been taken to imply that this injury may have resulted from interspecies conflict. Unlike the Shanidar I and II skeletons, which were actually discovered at a later time, the skull of Shanidar III was never recovered. The skeleton initially received little attention due to its fragmentary state and lack of a skull. Of particular note to researchers has been the presence of a sharp force trauma wound to the left ninth rib of this individual. The wound itself displayed signs of healing, indicating that this individual lived for at least several weeks after the injury itself had occurred. But then who or what killed this Neanderthal? While scientists have been unable to precisely date the remains, Shanidar III could have lived and died as recently as 50,000 years ago. If so, he could have encountered modern humans who were just returning to the area after a 30,000-year hiatus. It is also controversially proposed that some Neanderthals wore decorative clothing or jewelry, such as a leopard skin or raptor feathers, to display elevated status in the group, and that burials were also a sign of status.